I was really hoping for this to be an opportunity for us to um, really think about how this resource that's been funded by the Wisconsin Partnership Program could help to advance the research of this group, um, what work we have within the group to support things. Um, sample size isn't as large as some of the other PSG work that you guys do or uh, uh, some of the other larger genomics work that you guys do, I know, but maybe it's a validation set or maybe it's the foundation for a larger grant or one of several um, cohorts that we have here in Wisconsin that get linked together. So that's what I was really hoping to do um, in my presentation today. But I can start with some background on who I am and why I'm here. So um, recently I was uh, um, appointed to the National Academy of Sciences panel on emerging science and environmental health decision making, I think is the, the title of it. And one of the workshops that I had the benefit of attending is um, the aging in the environment workshop. And I realized within that space, there's a lot that we can continue to do. And so I've been thinking a lot about aging in the population. I've been a member of CDHA for quite some time, but um, I've been thinking a lot about aging in the population, um, what population health sciences is and what that can bring to the table. And because I know this is largely a social science group with some epidemiologists in here, I thought I'd give a little bit of background on those two things and then mostly talk about what we have within the Survey of the Health of Wisconsin. So um, before I get started talking, I'll just keep talking if people don't interrupt me. So is there anything that people, <laughs> is there anything that people want to hear about or are, are particularly interested in? Okay, okay. Some of you are very well, are very familiar with this resource we have here, some of you are not. So um, when I think about aging populations, aging phenotypes, I think about um, the list of aging related diseases, including cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative diseases, and and this whole issue of geriatric syndrome. And the show population right now on average, when, when we enrolled people into show the first round on average, people were between the ages of about 40% of the population was over the age of 40 to 45. So we have this middle-aged cohort in the state of Wisconsin that is actively aging right now. So we have an opportunity to start to think about um, interim biomarkers of um, aging across the life course in this population and get at some of this, um, some of the, the things pre phenotypes. So these are the phenotypes. And right now we have people who are actively living and moving and having their lives impacted by lots of different things, including COVID-19 as we move forward. Um, and we're actively engaged with our cohort so that we can look at what's this over here are sort of these interim biomarkers of aging across the life course. And I'll explain why we have, how we can do that with the resource that we have and why this is important. So when we think about, um, aging and the aging trajectory, right? Some people will have, we think of aging in a biological context as um, it's, it's inevitable, we all age, um, eventually we will all die. But when does aging and these aging phenotypes take over from our normal aging trajectory? Well, typically it happens when our body's repair mechanisms can no longer um, overcome a lot of the a lot of the stressors, the environmental stressors or the social stressors, and so normally that happens with age. It's just what we do, right? But um, there are a lot of other social factors um, that can change this trajectory of aging. Um, to make it a lot more severe. So maybe the detrimental effects in one set of population happens more or less than others, um, which can lead to this accelerated aging and age associated diseases in the population. So that's the sort of the biological framework. I often think of life expectancy and age as, a, as one of the key aging indicators. And we know last week, the report came out that would be due to COVID-19, uh, some populations have lost three years in their life expectancy just as a result of COVID-19. It's it's pretty dramatic, um, the impacts of, of all of the both social and biological factors related to this pandemic that are impacting the population. So these are from 2014. Um, I'm, an, I'm an environmental epidemiologist by training, so I often look at space and place um, as predictors of health and well-being. And you can see we see dramatic disparities across the entire country with respect to life expectancy as well. And and up here in Wisconsin, this is Menominee County, but you could also probably see some changes in life expectancy. I think what evens Milwaukee out a little bit is that we have um, these disparities in terms of high low income populations that live in the urban environment. 
but um, I can, you guys are probably all really familiar with this, but one thing that's unique about Wisconsin compared to other cohorts or other places or other national work is that not only do we have these urban pockets of, of disparities, we also have these rural populations. So I like to show this because we see um, in life expectancy, this is back in 2014, this is the central, oops, this is the central part of the state of Wisconsin. These are counties that most of us who live in Dane County our whole lives don't even really think about it. And I apologize there. Are, I know we have lots of students at UW who come from rural Wisconsin. Um, but, you know, these, ugh, I don't know why this is doing this to me. Okay. So there's male female differences across these different counties for the same um, place. And those vary by space and place. So we know that other things, probably occupation, probably um, lifestyle, probably other things are influencing these patterns, but women, are living longer than men in many of these contexts. Um, and in some cases, it's by about three or four years. So when you look at these quantiles, the highest quantile for women life expectancy is between 83 and 85 years, whereas the highest quantile for men is between um, 78 and 80 years. Um, and just for all the students out there, it drives me nuts when people do this, the scales on those two things and the colors are, are totally different. Um, so don't do that because you, you can't compare apples to oranges. So anyways, moving forward. Okay, so when we think about the social determinants of health, you guys are all in this context, but just as a reminder, it's the social and economic factors that shape longevity, healthy and productive living across the entire life course. So we can think about them really broadly um, and the contextual factors such as urban versus rural are, are a part of that. Um, another thing that really drives the work that I've been doing and I think about in using some of these cohorts that we have is a systems thinking approach. And this work comes from a mentor of mine, Ana Diaz Rue, who's done a lot of neighborhood in place and health research. Um, and she identified these two quotes from R. Stalins, which is, um, the burden of disease on a human population is part of an environmental system and the interrelatedness of the components of the system cannot be understood by pursuing research whose rationale is to divide and isolate the components in ever greater detail. Rather, if we consider disease to be embedded in a complex network in which biological, social and physical factors all interact, then we're impelled to develop new models and adopt different analytic methods. And so when I think about a lot of the genetic work that's being done here, epigenetic work, I think it really embodies a lot of this. Um, I also think of this because I am an environmental epidemiologist by training, and when I started training, all that anybody really thought about was this chemical environment at the top. And we know that all of this sort of intersects to impact our health and well-being. Um, and so most of you know what epidemiology is, but just in case, it's really how disease is distributed in the population and the factors or determinants that influence this distribution, very similar to what we just talked about. Um, and, and so this is the framework by which I tend to approach a lot of the different problems. And epidemiology is based on two different factors. And you can see this is slightly different than the systems thinking, but human disease does not occur at random. There's factors or determinants which increase or de decrease the likelihood of disease. And the factors or determinants can be identified by systematic in investigation. Okay. All of that's to say that we have new opportunities to begin to understand um, aging processes by thinking about all of the advances that have occurred in immunobiology and genetics and other um, <clears throat> risk factors in, in terms of the biology of aging and population health research or epidemiologic research. Um, and that going back to this aging trajectory, there's really a continuum of molecular alterations that occur over time. Genetics being one of them and DNA damage being another one of them and epigenetic changes over time that can move us from sort of clinical healthy status where we can start to observe these early changes before we get to these, the tip of the iceberg, which is a lot of these age related pathologies. Um, this is the hallmarks of aging and biomarker development. And within that, you can see that amongst the different biomarkers of aging, genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, all play a really important role in this overall aging process. Um, and these biological mechanisms are linked to so many different 
other systems that we have, one of them being biological mechanisms of stress. So we have the HPA axis, which also influences the endocrine system, the nervous system, the immune system, all of which are shaped by inflammation, oxidative stress, DNA damage, cell senescence. So all of our systems within our bodies are likely connected too, but um, the genetics and the genomics play a role in shaping sort of the homeostasis. When this stress becomes too much, then we end up moving towards that aging trajectory a little bit faster. Okay, so that brings me to the show infrastructure. Anything in the biology or the background or anybody wanna add anything in there? Okay, you all good? All right. So that sort of sets the stage on how I, I, how I come to this and why I think all of you may be interested in this. But what is SHOW? So SHOW was established in, two th well, planning began in 2006, but um, it was established by the Wisconsin Partnership Program within the Department of Population Health Sciences here at the university. Um, in 2008, we started collecting data. At the time, it was considered the only statewide household-based examination survey in the U.S. And what does that mean? It means that um, it's the only survey of its kind that um, has a representative sample of the entire state, and it collects both objective data on health and well-being. So we um, measure height and weight and blood pressure, lung function in individuals' homes um, or in an exam center, and then we collect a vast array of biological um, biomarker data that can also be used. Um, originally, it was designed to have these annual cross-sectional surveys over time, and it was modeled after the CDC's National Health and Nutrition Exam Survey, which is a national snapshot of health and well-being across the state, across the entire country. So when you go to the doctor and they say you're 95th percentile for height and weight, or your baby is, where do those data come from? They came from the NHANES. Um, the original director of the show program, when he established it, really wanted this to be what he called, rather than the stethoscope, to be sort of the MRI of population health research. So really a deep dive into all of the different determinants that shape health and well-being over time. Um, and I can, it, it's funding comes largely from the Wisconsin Partnership Program. We now have NIA funding. This is an old slide. ICTER has supported us some, and we also at some point got funding through the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. But um, as the director, the mission for me right now within the show program has gone beyond sort of the cross-sectional population monitoring approach to really support ongoing research, foster diverse partnerships and education in order to promote population health equity and well-being in Wisconsin and beyond. And so part of that mission is to make sure that this, uh, people across campus know about this resource and um, know how to access the resource, know what its potential is. And um, that's why I'm here today. Um, I think we all know about uh, why show uh, when I think about show now and why it's an important resource and why I even got involved is that it really um, supports this population health approach to better understanding health equity and outcomes and policy making and we really need the data um, and the science to be able to advance this framework in order to make those other things happen. So I think of it very much as an applied infrastructure, um, research infrastructure for gathering the data that we need for better policy making and better approaches to addressing health outcomes and equity. So we have lots of partners um, and we'll go through that. Here's sort of a snapshot of where we are in terms of show by the numbers to date. To date, we have, um, collected data, it's actually 5,800 adults. The, the extra 700 are the people that we've followed up longitudinally. So we have baseline data on 5, 000, over a little over 5,000 adults and 974 children. We don't have biomarker data on the kids, but we do have them on the adults. And most of the individuals that we've recruited into the show program have consented for um, future unspecified research and long, longer follow-up. Um, which means that we have it's a resource that can build um, additional longitudinal follow-up. We have over a, we have a biobank with over 210 biomarker or biosamples, cryo, tiny little cryovials sitting there that can also be used for research. And I'll talk a little bit about what some of those are. We have numerous collaborations. Um, students have used our work, and um, we have lots of different support from many different organizations. Um, okay. So originally the framework really was built on this uh, county health, uh, the social determinants of health framework and that we see 
physical environment, social environmental factors, clinical care, health behaviors, and outcomes all being important to building the general framework. So there wasn't one specific hypothesis by which this cohort was built. It was um, probably its Achilles heel is that it was built with all of these things in mind. And so there's no one real um, hypothesis driving the research. And then on the other hand, it means it's got a, a huge breadth of data from many different people. This is um, how, how we're now considering and, and describing the data. Wave one were these annual cross-sectional surveys of adults ages 21 to 74. In 2014 and 2016, um, we realized that this arbitrary cut point of adults 21 and to 74 was fairly arbitrary and really wasn't saving us any money. And in fact, there were individuals older the age of 74 who are perfect perfectly competent. Um, so we expanded the age range for the adults to 18 and above. Um, and then we added objective accelerometry data. Uh, we added whole blood RNA for transcription, transcriptomic analyses. And then we have some for a small subset, we have microbiome data as well. And we changed the sampling frame. So the first wave of data collection was these annual cross-sectionals, those blues blue boxes are um, for people not familiar with Wisconsin, our census block groups. So we did a two-stage probability sampling approach to gather data by the census block group. And within each census block group, our goal was to recruit about 12 to 14 individuals. That's a really inefficient model to get a statewide sample. So in 2014, 2016, we said, well, what if we do a statewide sample over three years? We randomly select 12 counties that are representative of the state as a whole um, with the hopes that, which hasn't happened quite yet, that we would do a, a you know another wave of statewide counties and approach another group. But right now we haven't quite done that. Um, but within this second wave, we um, gathered data on 2000 adults and um, over 645 children. And then um, in 2017, we did longitudinal follow-up on a subset of individuals. And the children that are added here are the children of wave one participants. So in wave one, we didn't recruit kids, but in wave three, when we did follow-up, if there were children in the household that wanted to participate, we included them. And then um, NIA, rightfully so, is really interested and in NIH in general in, in advancing health equity and our survey has been representative of the state, which means that our um, the representation from people of color with brown black skin um, who self identify in that context in our current sample was relatively low. So through 2018, 2019, we shifted our model a bit to um, really work with our community partners that we've been working with over the last several years to launch um, show within the city of city of Milwaukee and surrounding areas, in which case now we have um, really focused on recruitment of African Americans and Latinx into the into the show population. Then we were Sorry, can, uh, I, can I ask a clarification question? Yeah. So, I, um, so I'm wondering, like, how many years of uh, observations do you have for these people? And, and should we think of this actually as a panel study? Or is this more uh, a combination of, of various um, surveys? that were then thrown together in the end. So, right. So each way, well, so these two waves are unique. So this should be considered as all unique individuals that have been enrolled. We have one wave of follow-up. So we only have of 725 people who we have repeat biomarker and other things on, um, but each other of the waves is, um, are unique individuals. So you should think of them as, as sort of baseline with the potential for longitudinal follow-up on all of them. Okay, and the uh, the health outcomes there, they're also not uh, measured longitudinally. So there is nothing like digital health records that are automatically updated or something like that. Well, I can tell you in um, not automatically yet. So everyone in the, we just, we've been, I was just about to get to where we are now in 2020. So I will get to that, but that's good. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, as part of our COVID-19 <laughs> follow-up, we've been, we've done COVID-19 follow-up, we've done all longitudinal. So we took this entire cross-sectional sample and um, starting in May, we did an online survey um, of anybody that we could identify having a valid email address. Um, which biased things a little bit. So we couldn't get back in, we couldn't get all our phone numbers. It was COVID, it was early, it was May, but we wanted to really start to understand what the impacts of 
COVID-19 were on this population-based sample. So we did an email um, survey and we're doing the second wave of that email survey right now. So the first wave, we had about 1,300 people respond. Now we have about 1,800 people responding. Um, and the reason I'm telling you that is because we added to that consent the ability to link to electronic health records. So we, we don't have, we've consented, we've now consented that if individuals would like to and or others would like to come use the data for linkage with electronic health records for about, I would say about 85% of those said, sure you can. The challenge with consenting for electronic health records when you're not a hypothesis driven infrastructure is that <laughs> blanket consent to, to sort of get access to all of your health records for who knows what is really hard to do. So in this context, because <laughs> you can't, you don't have a hypothesis to say, we're really interested in cancer research. So we want to go back and we want to look at your cancer outcome data, or we have investigators who are funded to do cardiovascular research. So we want to follow, you know, only your problem statements around cardiovascular markers, which is really what the IRB wants for blanket consent to electronic health records. But we do have blanket consent to do linkage with administrative data. So McCall and I right now through our R01 funding at, through NIA um, ha, are reconstructing residential histories for a large portion of the entire cohort. So we can link with LexisNexis to get residential history, which then we can embed the um, census data on there. We also um, will be able to link with birth record data to get place of birth and other data around births. Um, and we can link to the cancer registry. Um, so any of those sort of vital statistics, administrative data, we have consent for within the population. It's the EHR part that becomes a little bit tricky. Um, we did do health, repeat health histories as part of the longitudinal follow-up. So, but that's, again, that will all be self-report. Um, so just for, for clarification, when we talk about digital health records, so how, how detailed are they and for, you know, what, what is the timeline for which they would be potentially available? So how, how far back do they go? Well, I mean, I think that really, that really will depend. I think that would require an investigator to support um, applying for funding to get those data. And then that would shape all of that. Because um, in Wisconsin, we have elect we have through our Institute for Clinical and Translational Research and our other healthcare providers, we have about 80% of the populations covered through resources that we have here at UW for that to make that linkage happen. Um, we just don't have the resources within show to make that a priority, but it would be a really good opportunity to potentially move forward, especially in light of COVID-19 and the long haulers and all the rest of it. Um, that might be of interest, but that would require additional ancillary study funding to support. I mean, so we've laid the foundation, but then we would need investigators to move that part forward. Gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kristen? Yeah? One, one clarification, wave two children and adults, they're never related or always related? Could, could you just restate that? The wave two children and adults are always related. So, it, so the you children have, so are there's related. at least dyads. So like there's 645 children, all of whom you have a parent for in the survey? Absolutely, and yes. Some, and sometimes more than one? Yep. Okay, so that's useful. I mean, that, that'd be useful to hang on to. It's, it's not an enormous study, but uh, like, but you can imagine putting that together, like having pairs and trios is still pretty rare. Is there anything like that's a, <laughs> um, anything that should make us really not optimistic about using that wave two family well, data? Well, we don't like, have that. Like a problem right. with it? <laughs> Uh, well, we don't have the genomic data on the kids. That's the problem. So if you want to do the social genomics, we didn't do, they didn't, I've only been the PI since 2020, but, um, or 2019, they, they just really chose not to collect biomarker data in the kids. They really just got more phenotypic response data in the kids. So to the extent that one might want genetic information, we don't have it. We do have a grad student right now who's working in um, biomedical informatics, um, who's really trying to take, so we have this huge biorepository that's fairly untapped. I did get resources through the Center for Inherited D Disease Research to do mega chip GWAS array data on about 725 people. So there's a lot of data for that you could use as preliminary data available. 
Um, and so we have DNA methylation data and we have GWAS mega chip array data on a subset of these individuals some of whom, about 20 of them, are actually related to one another. And we have a grad student who's working on those data right now to look at um, genetic um, similarity. Can you speak to uh, following up and asking all these 645 children to spit in a cup and send it to you? Um, we certainly could. So um, that would be, that would be, um, we have contact information for all these individuals. We have consent to follow any individual up, we probably could contact the um, adults within each each of these households and ask them to identify their kids, provide them incentives, give them the spit cup and ask them to send it back. And we can do that without a problem as long as they've consented for long-term follow-up. We tend to have pretty good response rates. We've never tried to do um, spit in a cup and send it back as part of what we've done, <laughs> but we certainly could. That's not to say that anything within the infrastructure prohibits us from doing that. Um, and most I, I, I'm not, I, I don't have in my mind if the sample size of dyads and trios is going to be like big enough, uh, either on its own or with some other sample. But I just want to get a sense of like what's impossible versus what's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, because as you say, you have the phenotypes from 2014 to 16. Of course, the genotypes could be done anytime. Mm -hmm. uh, with so that, that at least like restructures has the possibility of restructuring the data and still having those family relationships in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> so, okay, I forgot I had this in here. This is really fairly um, detailed. I can certainly send it to everyone, but this really is um, a, a, a compute. So, I guess we really have fairly detailed um, self-administered questionnaire data, CAPI data, physical exam data, and all of this is available on our website. And, and you can see it was really, um, it's a very well characterized. It's just not, as Jason says, relative to some of the other data sets that you all work with, it's not as big as some of those others. But I would say that it's, it's fairly representative of, of a state population. And we have the possibility for um, we have immediate biomarkers for immediate research, and then we have biospecimens stored for any any potential source of future biomarker research in the population. And can then, I, yeah. I ask, hi, this is Lauren. Can I ask a question? This is great. Um, yeah. For the um, methylation data, maybe you'll get to this, but what? Um, how many samples do you have there? Is it longitudinal? And then when you say you know that you have these biospecimens, how many of those? could potentially be profiled um, for epigenetics um, if the yeah. funding were to exist. <laughs> right, so Michal and I have RNA funding to, to do repeat biomarker on 1,400 of these individuals. So we have baseline DNA methylation for 650, 725, and then we will, um, we're just pulling the, the DNA right now to send to CIDR so that we will have repeat biomarkers on 1,400. We, uh, the hypothesis for the uh, the funding that Michal and I have, and this is a really good example, is that um, we're really wanting to look at how urban and rural disadvantage, first of all, how does one characterize those differences? So I think so much work has been done on urban disadvantage and urban life course, but very little has been done in rural disadvantaged communities. Even what do you, how do you define that? What does that look like? Um, and then what does that look like in terms of population mobility over time? So that's the, the major hypotheses that we have around uh, biological aging and DNA methylation work with, with these samples. And so we are gonna do focus recruitment. We're gonna take advantage of the fact that SHO has funding to do additional follow-up um, and we put in the R01 for additional follow-up um, to focus on um, persons of, again, following up on additional persons of color and then sort of socially isolated rural populations and then have all of the sociodemographics in the middle for the for the follow-up. So we should be done with that. We should be done with the follow-up by the end of mid 2022. So okay, again, COVID has thrown everything for a loop, but starting in March last year is when we were supposed to start that follow-up. We just delayed it by over a year and a half. But as you can imagine, going to people's homes is not necessarily, <laughs> yeah. 
if that makes sense. But um, in terms of genetic analyses, I guess, so once it gets, you guys would know this better than I do, right? Can you get DNA out of serum and plasma or no? You mean <laughs> blood samples or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anything, Not, I mean, anything with a nucleus. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, but this this hasn't been done yet. Uh, no, it has. But we do DNA extraction just as part of what we do. But but we have stored serum and plasma on everybody and everything, and we have DNA um, characterized on everybody. Um, but but it hasn't been um, it hasn't been sequenced on everybody. So the DNA has been extracted, but not sequenced on everybody. Um, and then, but the reason I'm asking that is that we have just we got funding last May through the Department of Health Services to do antibody surveillance. So what we've really spent the last year doing is, is doing ongoing antibody surveillance. So we have another separate from the online survey, we have about 1400 individuals who have done repeat antibody surveillance for us across the state of Wisconsin over three time periods during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, the reason this snuck up on me is we're about to go back into the field to do the other, the last, surveillance in a week. Um, so, so we basically collect the blood samples from these folks. We have blood. That's we amazing. Have blood. So we have okay. blood from everybody. And um, the majority of them we've um, consented for research. Yeah. Which means that um, a portion of the plasma and serum has gone to do the antibody testing and the rest of it's just stored. That, that I think that's perfect for DNA extraction and genotyping. Right. Really that's is. what I, <laughs> it just, it just like dawned on me while I was talking to the group, <laughs> like, wow, we could really do something with that resource. Um, and I think you can do it very cheaply as well. So if you, if you just go, let's say with the Illumina GSA um, global array, mm -hmm. uh, you may be able to just, uh, so given that the samples are already collected, you just need to extract the DNA and just uh, run it through the array. I think you can get that done for 35 bucks per person. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this, this is not a substantial investment. Mm -mm. So, um, yeah, we need to sort of tap into that. Research <laughs> well. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I'm glad you guys are here. So, um, and this, this is exactly the conversation that I sort of wanted to have with all of you. Uh, for yeah, people, uh, Kristen, just a point for clarification. So, so when you said you have blood samples for everybody, does that include the children? Because you said no. you didn't have genomic. No. no. So when I say, okay. I'm sorry, everybody who is an adult over okay. the age of 18. Right. But, um, I mean, I know there are some of you who are newer to Wisconsin and some of you who are not. Um, so like Jason's really well familiar with this, but people in Wisconsin love to do participate in research. So oftentimes our um, response rates for follow-up on certain things is better than in other places. So if you want to get genomic information from the kids, you know, that's what Jason was talking about. We could either have them spit, we could get blood spots, we could get, I mean, there's lots of ways to identify subsets. Now, the one challenge is because it is so well characterized and um, it was designed with having this objective and subjective health outcome data as part of its focus, um, we, you know, you sacrifice the total N for sort of this deep characterization around everybody. So we don't have, you know, the 35,000 that are in the HRS or some of these other larger, but but context sometimes can help too. So there's trade-offs and I understand that. This may not be ideal, but it's something that's sort of in our back door as a potential resource. Um, and again, sort of thinking about, I don't need to go through all the sampling frame stuff. Um, and I don't necessarily have to talk about the survey methods either, but um, this is what it takes to, to really recruit this many people. Um, before you go to a household, we do advanced mailings, we describe the project, we have field staff who go to the door. Um, they do screening and enumeration. Then, then once individuals agree to, um, participate, we do informed consent, then we go through all of the um, computer assisted work, the audio computer assisted work, the physical measurements, and then um, then we have self-administered questionnaires. We, we have objective 
Um, on the 2014 to 2016 sample, we have objective physical activity and sleep monitoring using accelerometers. Um, and then we have, um, and then we have the bio, bio specimen analysis. So we collect blood by venipuncture. We also collect urine. Um, so there's lots of biomarkers in here that could be used for potential DNA characterization. Um, a group of the data are sent immediately to Marshfield Laboratories for blood cell count, hemoglobin, platelet, some of these other interim biomarkers. And then we have serum, plasma, and urine, stool, and DNA samples stored in the biorepository, really for future unspecified biomedical research. And that's the really untapped piece of things. Um, another area of growing research is metabolomics. Um, the serum and the plasma can be used for metabolomic analyses. We have probably between 10 to 14 cryovials per person sitting in the biorepository that could support this type of work. Um, so have at it, people. Um, that's really, <laughs> it's, it's, it's somewhat of an, un it's not ideal, I get it, for those of you who are like, this is tiny. Um, it also is a platform for sort of moving things forward, I, th I think, and it, sh and it needs to be used. Um, just one one short remark. So for for the people where you have already extracted DNA, but you haven't genotyped them yet, so the actual yeah. genotyping is super cheap. So it's like you uh, the the chip uh, the chip costs about twenty bucks per person, and just okay. running it um, running it and you know the the lab work that comes with it is maybe five to ten bucks per person. So it's like I mean if you already have the DNA extracted, you should be able to genotype these people like for less than thirty bucks. Right. So, I, I mean, I wonder for some of this, if, if it's an RO3 application, right, that supports this, it's existing resources, it supports the analytics, and then it also supports the potential for analyses, even an RO3 that generates preliminary data for something larger or whatever. It's just, it's material that's at hand for folks to potentially use. And I think even our local ADRC has set aside some, some funding just for genotyping additional samples. Um, yeah. If you can justify this, it's related to aging, but obviously I think you can't uh, based on just the nature of the cohort. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah and so we there just, are ways to do it. Yeah. yeah, and we just participated last week in an NIA workshop. And, you know, of course, they're really interested in the diversity component of this. So this is a description of the sample prior to when we did the the um, work within Milwaukee to, to oversample in um, amongst persons of color. Um, so this, these numbers are a little bit different now, but the, the original goal is to have a really representative sample of the state of Wisconsin is um, came true with the weighted sample. You can get pretty close to what the state of Wisconsin looks like with the data that we have. Um, and this is true for both 2008 to 2013, that wave one and that wave two sample. Um, okay, so this is this slide sort of begins to answer some of your questions that we began longitudinal follow up again in of the 2008 to 2013 people in 2017. The plan was to extend that again starting in March of 2020 and then COVID hit. So then we've kind of gone on this other trajectory. But through CIDR, we were able to get um, a preliminary data on 650 individuals who also have microbiome data. Um, so we have microbiome DNA methylation and GWAS data. So in, individuals interested in sort of multi-omic analyses within this context, um, we have the 650 individuals that can serve as preliminary data for writing the grant to support sort of longitudinal follow-up and expansion of some of this work. Um, I don't need to go through all this. I can send you all the, and this, you don't really need to know all of this either. I can send you the, the, we have a paper that should go to MedX to like Friday. Um, I should fix a reference or two <laughs> that describes the whole the whole thing a little bit better than I've got right now. Um, but I can, if some, if people are still interested, I can show some of the work that we've been doing in terms of um, understanding the relationship between some of these de like social determinants of health and health outcomes in the population. So. Um, we've done lots of work on food insecurity as a predictor of cardiovascular health. So food insecurity um, is really prevalent throughout the entire urban and rural continuum within the state of Wisconsin. And we know that it's also associated with multiple markers of cardiovascular health. These could also be markers of aging, for instance, um, relative to what we have. And we know that cardiovascular health is um, also identified as a, um, a phenotype of aging in the population. Um, and 
we can look at um, also we can look at people's lifetime experiences. So lifetime discrimination. We have questionnaires about um, experiences of discrimination, and I it, interestingly there are a lot of non um, people of color who also have felt like they've experienced discrimination due to body size, body image, other sources of discrimination that people express within the population beyond just racial discrimination. So, and that is also a predictor of overall cardiovascular health within the population is what this is, is showing. Um, and then in terms of the phenotype of the sample we have, over two thirds of the state population is obese or overweight. So to the extent that metabolic health accelerates this aging process, and we have phenotypes by which to study how, how obesity versus other things influence this across the life course, we have um, data. So this is again, is a terrible figure because it's all 3D and wonky and whatever. But what it shows you is that um, we have normal weight individuals within the show population go all the way up to class three obese, which means that they're over, their BMIs are over 40, I think. Um, and so um, anything in the class one, two, class three, those are all people identified as obese. And what you can see is that obesity status increase. So do all of these potential um, phenotypes increase over time, um, including you could think of frailty, quality of life and other things as you age over time. And nobody really has dug into what does it mean to have these different phenotypes as you age across the, the life course as well. So that's another potentially untapped resource. Um, this is just some work that I've been doing along those lines to really look at what does obesity mean in terms of transcriptional differences um, as a result of um, shaping human sensitivity to environmental exposures over time. So in this study, we looked at, we did a really simple analysis with the data. We looked at non-smokers and we looked at smokers and we looked at, do you see differential gene expression um, in non-smokers and smokers based on obesity status? So we matched, we did a match, we did a Nessid matched um, study within the sample. And, and so we made sure that the non-smokers and smokers were matched on BMI. And then we were able to look at differential gene expression. Um, and so of course you could move forward and add the genetic information, how much is genetics driving these differentials, but what you can see is interactions by BMI in particular for this top one, which is related to DNA damage. Um, and so the GAD45A gene is a tumor suppressor gene. And what you see is that um, for individuals with a lower BMI, which is the black line, you can see amongst smokers compared to non-smokers, you see much higher expression of this tumor suppressor gene amongst individuals with a BMI less than 30. But if you have a BMI higher than 30, you have a much smaller expression of that. So the phenotype itself is changing gene expression in a way that may alter important genetic pathways that are protective, in which case that might be um, a, a mechanism by which um, DNA, um, the pheno your phenotype alters gene expression over your life course, which then alters the, the aging trajectory. Um, so that's just an example of how you can even take subsets of the show data and start to do some more um, integrated analyses. Um, so this is the R1 that we have, it's called the reward study, um, in which we're looking at chemical exposure, socioeconomic factors and neighborhood built environment around DNA methylation. This is the work that Michal and I have. This is just results from the first 600 people. Um, we haven't gone quite as far as Lauren with adding the grim age to it, but we can because we have the data. Um, but we looked at chronological age, phenotype, pheno age and Horvath age. This is all from a poster I presented uh, last year. Um, and then we have these questions about people's neighborhood perceptions. So what does it mean to live in these neighborhoods? So thinking about neighborhood context and the experiences of the neighborhoods you live in. Um, we ask over the last 12 months, how much stress did you experience from crime, traffic or safety? How much stress did you experience from discrimination? How safe do you think your neighborhood is from crime or traffic? Um, what do you think about the aesthetics of your neighborhood if it's well maintained? Um, and then we looked at predictors of accelerated aging in this population. So we looked at both the pheno age and the Horvath clock. Um, and our, our results are very consistent with other studies of phenotypic age versus, versus the Horvath age clock. And I can go into the details of the clocks if you want, but I know that Lauren recently presented this, but um, we can see that people who are normal weight um, have lower, so 
anything with a negative coefficient, these are beta values, anything with a negative coefficient is a protective factor. Anything with a positive coefficient is, um, and is accelerated aging relative to um, the population. So these are, um, and you can see that, you know, stress, greater than stress from meeting basic needs, you have accelerated biological aging. Greater than moderate neighborhood stress expression of that, you have accelerated aging by about two years. When you, these, and this, this is regressing the residuals of accelerated biological aging for the pheno age clock on chronological age, it's the residuals. Um, and then the same thing, current smokers are almost two years advanced. So to me, when I look at these data, reporting greater than moderate neighborhood stress has about the same association with cross-sectional association. So we can't say it's causal necessarily, but same association as being a current smoker on overall um, accelerated aging in this population. So that's where you can start to see where some of these different social factors intersect um, and then again, you know, the obesity status is also in that magnitude. Interestingly, I'm an environmental epidemiologist. When you look at the environmental data, we saw nothing. There's no <laughs> association between the environmental exposures in our population on these measures of accelerated aging in the population um, <clears throat> within this preliminary smaller sample. But we did see that amongst individuals who feel safe in their neighborhood, people who feel safe from crime, people who feel like they belong in their neighborhood, really see decreases in their accelerated biological aging relative to people who um, have three or more experiences of discrimination. And this is a slide I put together for community partners to try to explain this to them, which is why it's pretty simplistic. But the, the middle line is your actual age and you can see where, where you see accelerated versus decelerated aging um, across these individuals. So then we ran some regression analysis. And again, even after adjusting within the phenotypic age clock, we can see um, for smoking and other factors that you really don't, you can see um, an association with accelerated biological aging for phenotypic age. Interestingly, when you look at sort of potential mediating effects, and this could just be, um, it could just be colliders or mediating or other, these are all preliminary data, but when you add the environmental data in the, um, and it could just be power, the p or the, the um, associations are no longer um, statistically significant with respect to neighborhood stress and pheno age. But if you just adjust for smoking status and all of the demographic factors, you do see a st statistically a significant association. Um, in these cross-sectional data between neighborhood stress and accelerated aging in the population. So um, that's what we've done so far with accelerated aging, Lauren. Um, we're working on getting these things published and out the door and, and moving forward with a lot of it and expanding to the grim age clock and some other things. But COVID has sort of taken up our um, life. Um, so we have a public use data set available on the show website right now around COVID. It doesn't have the genomic data, so this group may not be as interested, but, but it has the potential to start to look at that. Um, we have um, the data are publicly available now. You can just go out and fill out a form and you can start to analyze the data. So if there are people with students who want to look at impacts of COVID-19 on the population, please do. These are just one slide of the 26 people from the outside who've come in and, and accessed our public use data set so far. Um, and then this is a number of different ways that people are using the show data. Um, so the MIDA study, I mean, I just think show is complementary to a lot of the other things that are ongoing. So the WLS, the MIDAS, the Beaver Dam offspring study, there's just a lot of population-based research in the same sort of context here in Wisconsin. And we need to be a little bit creative on how we think about using those moving forward. So I'm gonna finish with this one piece of things. Um, we have a scientific advisory board and they're really very interested in um, having us reach out to folks to use the show infrastructure, but also um, I'm trying to identify opportunities across campus. So this is one of those multiple opportunities, but we need to have some focus for our longitudinal follow-up moving forward. We can't continue on on this very like nebulous, non-hypothesis driven way. So um, we are starting the REAIM initiative, which is really thinking about um, researching equity and epigenetics, aging, inflammation, microbiome, metabolism, and the environment. So really building on the strengths of the data that we have to um, 
look at be somewhat deliberate in our longitudinal follow-up and longitudinal follow-up will start in August, September. If there are specific questions that this group is really interested in adding to the show data for that longitudinal follow-up and or special collection, um, please let us know because we need to get the IRB in by April, but now is sort of the window by which um, new questions can be added. So with that, I'm gonna stop. I don't even know what time it is. It's 9.50. <laughs> Kristen, one, uh, one small question and maybe uh, a little bit clarifying question yeah. about, so one thing that seems so special and this is what you're using is uh, for this residential history is that I, presumably you have uh, addresses for people at least in one point in time and you're trying, and then you're trying to add on to those. So yep. on the one point in time question, um, how easy versus hard would those residential addresses be to uh, pass to collaborators? Is that one of those off limits fields? Like entirely, I, I, the reason I'm asking just no. to back up is that, you know, there's other data sets that have a lot of the features that you have and are bigger. Um, so the question, one question is, you know, how is show special? And one of them might be the granularity and geography that you would have and actually be able to use versus like an HRS, which would right. never give you the street addresses to the people. Uh, yeah. Is that so? Can you comment on that? Yeah, for all of you as individuals here, we have um, we have restricted data within the Social Science Computing Center. If we get you onto our IRB, um, there's a couple different ways to do it. So, uh, for students in the audience, the the geographic information is just ident like is an identifier. It's like handing you name and add it's like handing you the name of the participant, which is why everybody else sort of restricts it. Um, but we have ways of using it and accessing it and it, it's available to any UW investigator and we can work with you on getting the IRB approval to get that to happen. And there's a couple different things. If you say, here's my base layer and I want you to do the spatial join and linkage this way for us, we can help facilitate that within show and do it for you. Um, we can create a data set that has like 10 times the addresses you know, but keep the code behind the scenes. We can create the 10,000 addresses. You can put your exposure data in there and then we can go back and do the actual match and linkage for you and work with you to make sure you're comfortable with the QA, QC that's happened. That's another way to keep it somewhat confidential. And then we, we've done that. Um, another way is for um, an individual, a UW investigator to get on our IRB, um, come to show or and or now virtually within the SSCC sort of framework, get secure access to the address files and work with it that way. So that's how Weiju and some others have been working with the address-based data is that they're on our IRB, they have consent to work with the identifiable data. We keep the addresses while the exposure linkage is happening or you know whatever the contextual information is separate from the actual survey data. And then we help support the linkage with the rest of the survey data post that. And I draw, so thank you, thank you for that. And just one other small thing, just to have the possible opportunity on the table, this partnership yeah. program that you described way in the beginning, yeah. my vague understanding is that it's really, it has this, there's like quite a bit of funding available. And I dropped this website into the chat for those who've never heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's this funding opportunity at Wisconsin that's very much channeled through uh, the medical school and, and school of public health. And that with collaborations, everyone on the call could be uh, a part of a funding opportunity. Is, is that, could you maybe back up and eat, both correct me or maybe restate it in, in the correct way of what this partnership opportunity is? Yeah, one of the things that, um, yes. So I will, the, the partnership program will not fund this infrastructure in perpetuity. Well, they will probably fund the sort of data repository components of it and the storage of the data. Um, sort of the longitudinal follow-up piece of it will probably will not probably is likely going to diminish on over time they really would like us to get external nih and other dollars to help support that that being said um, they've put tremendous amount of resources into building this infrastructure and if there are groups of investigators um, they have annually, they have a series of calls. So anybody as a PI or investigator here who's interested in one of these outcomes that wants to work with clinical faculty or an epidemiologist and wants to do a project um, through the partnership program, they certainly can apply for those funds. The partnership program's focus for this five-year plan is really on equity, um, but they welcome 
high impact sort of cross disciplinary research applications. And so yes, anybody here at UW is is um, welcome to apply for funding through the partnership program. But is my understanding right that while anyone can apply, the there is a criteria that there has to be some sort of faculty involvement from like Pop Health or someone in SMPH. Yeah. Yeah. So I and can't we, apply I can't apply as a single PI. Uh, and I think neither can most people on the call. It would be a, a collaboration with, I'm just trying to just set out this criteria because I no, think there's right. a lot of kind of untapped opportunities here, untapped from our perspective, not from SMPH perspective uh, of, <laughs> uh, yeah. of, of working. In, in, and the reason I'm bringing it up now is because show might be exactly like an opportunity of analysis with show in collaborate, again, underlining, I think it's in collaboration with folks in SMPH yeah. would allow uh, a responsive application to this call. Is that your understanding? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think as the director and the PI right now, I, I, I wouldn't expect or want those interactions necessarily to come through me unless it's specifically related to some of the work that I'm doing. So just I'm just putting that out there. But I, that we can connect you with lots of other investigators within SMPH that may actually be interested in collaborating with you on, on something like this. And my goal in presenting all of this is to really have you all think creatively on how you could go, you know, make use of this untapped resource for the work that you're doing, not that I want more collaborations on research. Um, so let me be clear about that. I'm really standing here as sort of the advocate for, wow, here's a group of people. So I guess I can say this somewhat offline, but also online a little bit. Um, we have an incredibly strong basic science research infrastructure here. We have an incredibly strong set of clinical researchers here within the School of Medicine and Public Health, and we're a huge R01 funded institution globally at the UW Wisconsin. Um, the folks that I find most um, sort of amenable to understanding the value of this population health research is the social scientists. So like you all are my friends and understanding the value of what this is and isn't with respect to the population-based um, data that we have collected over time, because clinicians really like to work with clinical samples and um, that's what they understand and they understand patients, sort of this understanding people and their environment and the context in which they live is not as familiar to them, although it's becoming increasingly familiar to them. So the show program is also going to become part, I don't know if any of you all are part of the Carbon Cancer Center, but we were, were recently going to become part of a shared service to help facilitate use of the show infrastructure. And there's probably pilot funds via the Cancer Center too. Um, and I know that the Cancer Center, as long as you're a cancer member, you don't have to be part of SMPH to be doing work that supports cancer. Cancer, again, is one of those outcomes of aging. So I think there's a lot of ways that you, <laughs> you can be creative about framing your research and get funded through the Cancer Center too, to think about some of these different outcomes as well. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, Jason, but I, I do think that there's lots of ways to advance this and I'm happy to have, talk to whoever is on the phone about how to do that. And just because you're talking to me doesn't mean that, I guess, it doesn't mean that you're signing up for a long-term collaboration specifically with me. I would love to have lots of people and I'm happy to work with you all. That's not what I'm saying either, but I think it will be advanced and the utility and impact will be greater if lots of investigators come to the table and make use of the resource independent of, of sort of the stuff that we're doing. Happy to answer any other questions or let you all go. I hope this was useful. Um, let me know if there's anything more you need or want, but um, or how you might be able to do it. We have a great team of analysts currently at show who can help you access the data. Um, again, we have public use data set requests. We should have the 2008-2013 data out there. There will always be a restricted data file, but for UW investigators, restricted is less restricted than what you're used to probably with HRS or some of the others. It does. It's not as, we want to reduce those barriers, especially for UW investigators and we can easily pop you on to our show IRB. Um, again, if you've gone through human subjects training, which I'm assuming most of you have. So. Thanks, Kristen. You're welcome. So as you said, I'm, I know that you're willing to take comments offline too. This is a yeah. great uh, resource that we could all uh, engage with in the future. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions before we wrap up today? I have a quick question. Yeah. So are there uh, some overlaps with uh, WIS? With the WLS? Not right now, there isn't. Okay. 
I, th I think the overlap becomes sort of the spatial context in which individuals are living. So um, the, the WLS was high school graduates from across the entire state. And then um, I, I'm pretty sure McCall's looking into also trying to identify opportunities to expand the diversity of the WLS sort of follow up components. And so there might be moving forward. McCall and I haven't had time <laughs> to really get our heads around what that might look like, but not yet. But because there is an overlap, that means there, there could be an opportunity to potentially combine combine the two different samples in thinking about things, which would then expand the numbers that we have. Thanks, right. Tristan. You're welcome. Thanks, you, you guys. Thanks for the opportunity. You, uh, next week. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>